So thank you. I'm very impressed with that introduction. It made me sound better than I am, so I appreciate that. Um, what a privilege it is. One of my favorite things to do is to get in front of aspiring business and entrepreneurs, um, small business or entrepreneurs. And uh, I was sitting there thinking that in two weeks I want to maybe slip in the back and see if hopefully you did get something from this lecture. <laughs> So I, so I might, uh, Stephen, slip in the back in a couple of weeks and make sure you got something from this. Um, I think your time is incredibly valuable, and so I hope that in the next 30, 35 minutes, I hope to be able to provoke your thinking. And I entitled this, this lecture today not exactly as I planned, and let me explain that, because I'm an incredible planner. Uh, anyone who has worked for 23 years at Procter & Gamble you learn one thing, you learn how to strategically plan and build brands and with ruthless execution, execute those plans. In fact, the CEO of Procter & Gamble, who had quite a run during my executive career, a man named A.G. Laffley, A.G. Laffley said, P&G is really known for strategy. And A.G. Laffley said, our customers or consumers never see our strategies. What do our consumers see? What do they see? What do customers see? Your execution. They only see what you execute. So strategy without execution is nothing. And in fact, if you had to have one good thing, you'd want to have good execution. Now, I'm a big believer in strategy and execution. So let me tell you, um, you I think Stephen covered it. I guess you know what's interesting is I always have a hard time when people uh, talk about me as an entrepreneur because I don't really think I'm an entrepreneur, but I guess, by the way, based on the last seven years of my career, I think I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I'm not sure I've succeeded, but I guess I haven't failed, and that's pretty significant in the realm of entrepreneurship, and you all know what I'm talking about. How many businesses in the, in the United States today fail? What's the percentages? Even with all of our technology and all of our digital opportunities and all of our great educations, all of our great entrepreneur centers, what's the, how many businesses out of 10 make it? One. I think it's one and a half now, so we maybe got an extra half percent. Um, it's a very, very difficult life, a very difficult choice. Um, I, I wonder sometimes why I left my executive job and first class uh, life at Procter & Gamble and why I did this, but I will tell you it is part of my title today. It's not exactly as I planned. My entire career, coming on 30 years now, was not exactly as I planned. Now, don't take that as someone who was zigzagging and just wondering and letting it all come to him, because I can show you one-year, five-year, ten-year goals every year that I did. I'm a planner. I'm a strategist. But it wasn't at all exactly as I planned, and I heard from some other speaker you must have had it, you have to be able to plan, make adjustments, and go with it. So let's talk a little bit. There's a great, um, one of my favorite movies. Anyone familiar with the movie Moneyball? It's a great movie. One of my favorite lines in this movie. Give a listen. So I love that line, okay? <laughs> He's got an ugly girlfriend. Ugly girlfriend means no confidence. That might be true in some cases, by the way. But what does, you know, the, the point was that what was the story? What was the story? It's such an entrepreneurship story. What was the story? Bingo, did you hear what he said? Does that sound like an entrepreneur's life? I can tell you yes. No money, had to think very differently, and had to really think through, and how did they do it with data and analytics and strategy? 
Um, so it's a great part of the story. You, we have to think differently. Now, here's the discussion path. Stay with me because I'm going to be a little bit whip neck on how I'm going to go through this. But it, it's, I want to make sure, Stephen's going to make sure I've got 10 minutes left because at the end, the most valuable thing I hope I can share with you is you have an unbelievable opportunity. I, my learning curve, so I've been with one of the preeminent advertisers, brand marketers, global uh, businesses, uh, Procter & Gamble, $21 billion brands for over 20 years. And you would have to imagine you know, five different countries, six different businesses. Um, uh, you would have to imagine I learned a few things. And you would have to imagine that my learning curve was pretty steep, right? 144,000 employees, about 50 general managers, you know, 1% that make it to the executive level at P&G did all of that. Not so important. I joke around with my first company and my second company. My first company, I was the only 50-year-old with all 20-somethings. And it was a great collision because I told people 50% of what I learned at Procter & Gamble, the preeminent brand marketer and advertiser was no longer relevant. Now, I like to remind them that 50% still was. Um, and my learning curve in the last five years has been more significant than my previous 20 plus years at P&G. Now that's an opportunity for everyone out there. And I'll give you some context at the end what that means. So let me walk you through first the ore brush story. How did this crazy, you know, Procter & Gamble global guy end up back in Utah and end up with a really cool story on a startup company called Orbrush. And that was pleasing for me, by the way, to see that you'd all heard about Orbrush. How many of you have used an Orbrush? That's more important. OK, thank goodness. All of your spouses and partners and girlfriends and boyfriends, thank you. Thank you for using that so that you, you don't have bad breath. The rest of you, I can't help you. OK, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Orbrush story. And then, as is, as, as is my title, not exactly as I planned, Molio was actually what I had originally planned, but it took a lot longer, cost a lot more, and a lot more pain to get to Molio. I'll tell you a bit about Molio and where we are. And then I want to talk about, I love talking at BYU. I'm, I'm, I, as Stephen said, we bleed red and blue in the Davis family, mostly red, although I have a son here in the front row that would take issue with that. Um, my wife also, in her 50s, great story, after we returned 18 of our 20 three years at Procter & Gamble abroad, and she came home in one of her great regrets after I married her and we took off on this crazy path in our career. She regretted never having graduated, and she in her 50s went back and graduated from Brigham Young University, so I'm very proud of her. <laughs> Amazing story. I normally get emotional when I, when I talk about it. Because studying statistics in your 50s isn't easy, my friends. But it is a legacy that she will leave for our kids and others. And the, and the message is, not exactly as she planned, but never stop learning. And, um, and so as we go through this, I have, a, I have a, a personal story I want to share with you. There are no coincidences in your lives. And your careers and your schooling and your relationships all matter. There are just simply times we don't understand what's going on. Well, I want to share a story with you that we saw a 22-year coincidence that never was a coincidence all through the 20 years. Then I want to talk to you. It's, I'm often asked, what's the difference between running billion-dollar businesses on a global level at Procter & Gamble and running a startup? And it's actually, surprisingly, not as many differences as you would think. And then finally, uh, and this is what I want to make sure Stephen gives me 10 minutes on, you know, what does it take to succeed today? I have had a unique seat on the global platform, on the global economy, um, to, to have a few insights, which hopefully will be helpful to you as you move forward. So here's where it all started, Orbrush. Um, I left Procter & Gamble. I know I look like an old guy, but I'm not that old. I, I retired from Procter & Gamble. Now, what did that mean? Does anyone remember 2009? Um, I was running the global hair business, the global salon business. I know what you're thinking, the ball guy that ran the hair business, I know. Let's take it out of the room right now. I just, I used to tell people that I used a lot of competitive products in my youth, so make sure you buy Procter & Gamble products. Um, so in 2009, um, 
P&G was looking to get rid of a lot of presidents and vice presidents and general managers, so they basically lowered the retirement age, made it voluntary. We were being asked to move from Frankfurt, Germany, down to Geneva, Switzerland, which would have been our eighth international career move. 11, by the way, over 23 years, which sounds terrible, but uh, we were six years in San Francisco, we were five years in Canada, we were four years in Germany, but we did have several other short, short, short jaunts and a unique opportunity. We joke around that our kids are either going to be in therapy at 30 or they're going to be pretty well grounded um, in this future economy. Cole has lived in four, four different countries and, and spent most, he, he never learned U.S. history until he actually came here uh, in, his, uh, in his, high school, his final high school years. So um, I'll come to that a little bit at the end. You don't have to have our lifestyle or have lived or moved a lot but you do have to be growing, and I'll give you some thoughts about how you, how you do that. So I was the, I, you know, the question was when I retired, I really wasn't retired, so the question was what am I gonna do and where am I gonna live? Well, I'm originally from Utah. I joined Procter & Gamble right out of the University of Utah and had this crazy uh, career. So we came back here, I was teaching up at the U, enjoying my life, made the fateful or unbelievably smart decision to invest in Orbrush. I was the angel investor with another gentleman named Mike Leventhal, very, very amazing uh, entrepreneur, venture, venture guy here, lives up in Park City. We invested in Bob Wagstaff, 75-year-old Wag Bob Wagstaff, and the Harmon brothers, some young guys that you, you're probably familiar with, very, very successful. They really knew the zeitgeist of what was going on on YouTube. And I knew there was something there. It was just fascinating to me. They had, when I met with them, almost a million views on YouTube, and at the time, in 2009, this is 2000, late 2009, no one knew what a YouTube view was, and most people watching YouTube were doing what? What were they doing on YouTube? They were watching funny dog and cat videos. No one knew you could actually advertise. Well, in July of 2009, they had just launched promoted video, and the, as, the, as the story goes from Google, better told by Google than by me, where one of their case studies, Orbrush was the first product to be commercialized on a global level just using YouTube advertising. So it was this amazing story. And this is what kicked it off. How many of you have seen the video, the original Bad Breath video? All right, I won't show it all to you, but it's important as an entrepreneur. This video cost $500, was shot in a pool hall here in Provo by the Harmon Brothers and, and Austin Craig and and Joel Ackerman and Dave Ackerman, we had this amazing group of people that were just so smart about what was going on. They had no previous tapes, they had no previous Procter & Gamble or, or big national brand advertising tapes and, and traditional means, they just were looking at what was going forward. So I'll, sh I'll show just the beginning of this. Uh, Kaisen, if you can do that for me, thanks. Okay, so it's two minutes and 14 seconds. The amazing thing about that video, um, and I think I have it coming in just a minute, but the amazing part of that video, it's approaching 70, 80 million views on YouTube. It's generated more than five, six, seven million dollars in online sales alone. Um, and has had an amazing impact on the YouTube ecosystem. It, you, you recently heard Dollar Shave Club being sold to Unilever for how much? Does anyone remember? Billion dollars, over a billion dollars, Stephen. Um, Mike, th th this, is, this, is not a, this is another one of these not exactly as I planned stories. So Michael Dubin, the CEO of Dollar Shave Club, when he ran that original video, you remember the funny original video on YouTube, he said that he was inspired by Old Spice and Orbrush. And in fact, we even took a call from Michael who said once it was blowing up on YouTube, hey, could you guys create some content for me? You know, I didn't really plan on this. Well, not exactly as I planned. I, we were in the middle of launching Orapup, our, our, our second product, um, a tongue cleaner for dogs. And so we decided not to make content for, for Michael Dubin and Dollar Shave Club. Might have been a mistake. Might have been a mistake for us. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we kept learning. 
So the idea I had, at least at the time, we called it reverse marketing. Today we call it the Molio method. What did I mean by reverse marketing? Well, you in this room won't even know what I mean by reverse marketing. But for those in my generation, we had grown up for 20, 30 years with a campaign strategy where you put television at the center of what you do, and then you bolted on some other channels for marketing. And so when I talked about reverse marketing six years ago, it was start with digital, start with video, start with YouTube. Now, do you think that sounded a little crazy for a former P&G guy? Start with digital, start with video, start with YouTube. Now, the, the, the one smart thing we did is we picked the right platform. YouTube today is the platform. In fact, there are more 14 to 49, there are more 18 to 49 year olds that watch YouTube. YouTube is the new TV. There's more 18 to 49 year olds that watch YouTube than any other cable channel, channel uh, independent cable channel, including ESPN, for example, which is a shocker. Um, so we just picked the right horse. And the idea was start in Utah, build it online. Like for you guys, it's like, yeah, duh, no kidding, Jeff. Exactly, that's what you do. But seven years ago, that wasn't exactly what you do. Um, and here's the fun part. You know, these guys actually, my, my, my team put this out before I even knew it. I, did, I would have never approved this. Uh, but I'll show you this. This tells a little bit of the story. Oh, I think we've, you've got to help me with Kyson. Thank you. Sorry, I got to set this up just a little bit, Kyston. I forgot. So it's pretty important. Do you remember when the movie came out um, with Mark Zuckerberg uh, on, about Facebook? Do you remember the social network? So this is what entrepreneurs do. And for me, by the way, remember, I was drinking from the fire hose. I was the angel investor, helped him set up a board, helped him secure a Series A round, got so interesting, we really needed some help. So I came on as the CEO. But I was far from an entrepreneur. I was learning rapidly how you do this. So the social network came out, got a tremendous amount of buzz and everything else. And I think it was literally seven days later, 10 days later from the social network being launched, we launched this video. Oops, sorry. There we go. You're going to cure the world of that rat. Huh. 
<laughs> now, the, the interesting part of that story, first off, I take issues with the casting of Jeff Davis in that story. But the interesting part of that story is we had an incredibly engaged community at this stage. And people actually thought we were going to make this movie. And so we literally paused for a moment and thought, wow, maybe we'll make this movie. Um, but it just shows you the power of content and the right medium and what you might do. Um, it was a great, great part of it. Now, the amazing thing is what Dr. Bob wanted. He literally did want that. He's an amazing man, by the way, 80 years old, 81 years old, one of the most amazing men I have ever met. And he's been an entrepreneur, but think of that, a 75-year-old entrepreneur um, and successfully, in this case, uh, exited, which was, was, was literally, I felt more pressure to make a deal for Bob Wagstaff than for anyone else because of the amazing contribution he had made. We did become the number one tongue cleaner in the world uh, by, by Nielsen IRI data, became a leading innovator in social media video marketing. Uh, check this out. Imagine the day I woke up and the US, uh, USA Today published, you know, Orbrush, one of the top 10 products to watch in 2012 in their trend alert, which included brands like Tide, Cheerios, Kleenex, and Kraft. I kind of said, okay, wow, that maybe I did make a good choice to invest in this company. A um, little bit of the, so um, you're, you're not going to read all this. I'm not going to take a lot of time. But there's always this amazing story about entrepreneurs where you only hear what? The exit or the great story. This story began back in 2004 when Bob filed for the original uh, tongue cleaner patent. He tried to license it to Procter & Gamble, to Johnson & Johnson. No one would do anything. He tried an infomercial. It failed. He spent all this money, his last ditch effort with, uh, with Jeff and Neil Harmon, and they said, hey, Bob, we can sell that for you on YouTube. And then look at the amazing uh, experience here. We raised money twice. Um, we, uh, we did a strategic partnership with P&G, which was pretty ironic for me, obviously, <laughs> as we went in and taught them about how, uh, how things could work on YouTube. Got into an amazing footprint on retail. These were the three products. We started out with Orbrush. Then we had Orbrush Tongue Foam launched with our model. And then we, we launched Orapup, uh, a tongue cleaner for dogs, in March of 2013. Um, take a look at this. 10 billion online impressions. What's an impression? You know, what is an impression? What is it? Someone in marketing has got to be in here. When it shows up, it's, it's, it's like online for your generation. It's anything in the northeast corner of the website. You know, that's an impression. A YouTube impression, I wrote an article on this. A YouTube impression is the most valuable impression in the world. Why? It's a 5 to 29 second view of the video. You know when you get on YouTube and you can skip after 5 seconds? That's called TrueView Skippable platform. We helped uh, develop that with, with Google. And you don't pay for a 5 to 29 second view of the video. You only pay at 30 seconds on YouTube. That's why I love the platform. So um, 340,000 fans on Facebook. This is pretty impressive. 25 countries, 75 retailers, 30,000 retail outlets. I know how difficult that is to do. I know what a normal path and cost that would be in a normal company, let alone in a 15 to 20 uh, person company here in Provo and Orem as, as we built it. I loved what we said down here. I always say that we just, we just used YouTube advertising. Google tells a story, the first company to commercialize on a global level just using YouTube advertising. That's true, but we got a lot of unpaid press. We had a lot of interest in our story. I loved what TechCrunch said. Orbrush's use of YouTube may be more impressive than, say, Pepsi or Old Spice. What do you think the budgets were at Old Spice and Pepsi? OK? So the, what we were doing was ver very leading edge, and we were having a good time. I have three of these slides. I couldn't find the first one. But this is kind of one of those slides where you just look at it and you say, wow. Orbrush was, of all, t all, all of YouTube channel view rank, we were the 134th all-time view rank. We had more subscribers that we had more, we had, uh, you know, more views than Old Spice. We had slightly less views than Coca-Cola at the time. Now, of course, everyone began to figure it out over time, but we were pioneering there. 
This is also one of my favorite moments. So this came out last year, the 10 most iconic moments on YouTube. And you would have known all of the other nine brands. I gave you a couple of here on the bottom, okay? But YouTube, I loved it. They, they, Warbrush was one of the 10 most iconic moments on YouTube. I mean, think of that. Pretty cool. Our, our, our little Utah company achieved that. So that's Orbrush. Now that's part one. That was part one of my little crazy entrepreneur journey. And like I said, I'm not sure I succeeded, but I didn't fail. I recovered all of our investment capital, a lot of which was mine, and then some. But we knew there was a bigger idea. I didn't really have an intention to run a small oral care company. I was really trying to disrupt and figure out a way to create a, a new business. And let's talk about that for just a second. How do we create a new business? What do you need? You need three things. There's many things that you'll learn in business school, but, but, but what are a couple things you need to learn? So if you have a product or an idea, you've done some basic research, et cetera, there are three things It's pretty fundamental that you need, and that's why you need to understand what we've done with a couple of our, our exercises here. What do you need? You've got something that's cool. It's working. You've got it. What do you need? What's the first thing you need? Money, yes, you do need money. But if I had money, let's assume I've got a little money, what's the first thing you need? Let's assume I've got a little product, that's fair. Okay, I've got a prototype. I, in the case of Orapup, I didn't have product, and I sold a million dollars of pre-orders. So I didn't even make the product yet. What did I need? Right team, right team. And, again, and this is purposely, I'm drawing this out like this, okay? All these things, of course. But it's really fundamental. What do you need? Business model? Business model uh, yes, definitely as well. Let me give you the example. In the Google Play Store and the iOS Store, iTunes Store, do you know how many apps are in the, in those, in the stores? Over 5 million. What do they need? What, how, do you think 5 million of them are succeeding? What do they need? They need customers, OK? So you don't really have a business, do you, until you have, a, until you have customers? And how do you get customers? It's point one. You need a certain level of? You've got to identify a pain point again, absolutely. And, I, and again, all these, all these answers are right. Yes, you need that. Because by the way, in, in P&G, it's a huge deal, okay? We had POD and POP. POD was points of differentiation. POP was points of parity. If you don't have more, if you don't have more points of differentiation, if you don't have more POD than POP, are you going to win over time? You won't. So don't waste your efforts, OK? Three things you need fundamentally. You need a, if you have a product or service and you're ready to go, even if you haven't made it yet, you need a certain level of awareness about what you're doing, don't you? And that sounds easy today, but it's more difficult. When I started at Procter & Gamble, there were five ways to create awareness for a product or service. Television, radio, print, magazines, and events. That was about it. I gave an interview um, last year, and they were asking me, you know, how, how, do you, how, do you, how many, you know, how do you get awareness today? And I just started writing down all of the ways you can get awareness for a product or service. I think I ended on 33 and wasn't finished. And 90% of them were what? Digital. Has the landscape changed? So first, you need awareness for your product or service. Now you've got awareness, you've got maybe Molio working for you, you've got someone creating a lot of awareness on digital, search, display, retargeting, video, whatever it is, you've got awareness. What's the second fundamental thing as an entrepreneur you need to know if you've got a business model or not? You've got a lot of awareness, what do you now need? Trial of the product. People come and tell me how many Facebook uh, likes they have and how many views they have on YouTube and I say, how many people are trying as a result of the awareness? It's a funnel. How much, I've got a million people that are aware of the product. How many of them have tried the product? And I sit on a couple of boards and help people in funding, and, and they come to me with that. They come to me with one and two, and they say, we've got a lot of awareness for our product. We've got a bunch of people that are trying it. Do you have a business yet? Do you? Do you have a business if you have awareness and trial? You're missing one more critical piece for me before I'm investing. Re Stephen, purchase, okay? Okay, so, so here, here's the important point. You've got awareness, trial, and repurchase, okay? That's what you have to have to have a business. And the repurchase is probably the most, most important measure. Okay, as usual. 
All right, I'm going to zip through Molio. Molio is a pretty cool little company. We're a creative and media analytics company, and we've got about 20 brands on the platform. Think of us as the intersection of Madison Avenue and Silicon Valley. So we create content, manipulate the content to make sure that we can target on the unbelievable analytics that you, you can achieve on Facebook and YouTube video. Here are some of our clients. So we've done big brands, little brands, several categories, as you can see. Um, and what we basically are doing are, it's a spin out of what we originally did with our own products, and now we're doing it for others. It's much more technical, it's, it's much more of a model, um, and you get very high grade analytics and media uh, reports which show you, you'd never invest a lot of money in your brands with me until you know it's working, okay? Lots of reasons to believe we're doing a whole bunch of cool things. I want to get though to this last part. So. There are no coincidences in life, and I'll probably just take the last few moments to tell you this story because it is the most relevant part of my journey. Remember what I titled this lecture? Not exactly as I planned. Well, let me tell you a little bit about this story. In 1994, I left San Francisco with three children, five-year-old, a three-year-old, and my son who just left, who was eight weeks old. We left from San Francisco to Bratislava, Slovakia, Czechoslovakia had just split into two countries, and the East was opening up for the Western businesses. And I opened up Slovakia for Procter & Gamble. I remember when I was asked, and when I was asked by our venture capitalist, you know, have you ever done anything entrepreneurial? And I, and I didn't try to be an entrepreneur. I wasn't trying to be one. But by the way, I opened up Slovakia for Procter & Gamble from nothing to a, to a $24 million business. And so I think about it today, and I think, yeah, I think I actually was an entrepreneur there wasn't the easiest thing we did. But the story is less about business and more about our personal journey as a family. This woman on the left, her name is Ika Bejnadikova. Ika was assigned by Procter & Gamble, coincidentally, to be our assistant when we arrived in the country. We didn't speak Czech or Slovak. And we were there, uh, this, is, this is a time now when we were in Prague, this is, that's, those are my parents, uh, that's my, uh, actually Cole's not in there, but those are my two oldest children. And Ika helped us, we couldn't speak to her, she couldn't speak to us, but we spoke the language of love together. She was with us, we, we stayed in contact with her after we left. Um, here's a picture of her holding our youngest daughter. And so we left, we, we sent her Christmas pictures each, uh, each year, she sent us a Christmas card. In fact, she would send us a Christmas card and an Easter card because Ika was a believer. But during the years of communism, that belief had been suppressed and she had been disadvantaged greatly because of that. So we kept in contact with Ika. Well, no coincidence, guess what? Cole Davis, that little one-year-old baby that she used to carry around in her arms as she was in our home, and speak Czech to him. She'd sit there and speak Czech to him. We didn't know what she was saying. He gets a mission call. Guess where he gets called? It's called back to the Czech Republic. This is a picture of our family in 1995. I'm sorry, I will not get through this story. It's a tough one for me. And so there's Cole sitting in the exact same place in 2014. We tell Ika when he gets his mission call, Ika, Kol, Koliba, she called him, little Koliba. Koliba is coming back to your country, and he's got a message we want him to share with you. And so, you know, here you see Cole again. If you take a look at that, that's perfectly matched up with the original Prague Square. That's Cole and his mission companion over there. And then here is, here's Cole as a little three-year-old. So Cole starts to teach Ika. She's receptive. She, 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 uh, she listens. And so we thought, okay, this cool little story, she's going to get baptized. Well, Ika just said, amazing story, which I can't take a lot of time to tell you about, but she said, it's amazing, but I'm not, I'm not ready to be baptized. Well, Cole gets transferred out of Prague, and I'm like, God, come on, this is, a, this, is this perfect 20-year-old conversion story. What's going on here? Well, Ika then studies the gospel, attends the Prague branch religiously every week for a year and a half, almost two years. And then she takes a train ride down to a, a city that Cole was in, 
and she comes to it and she says, Cole, I'm ready to be baptized. The mission president, knowing the amazing story, this is 11 days before Easter 2015, and the mission president says, we know the story. We know this is a family baptism. And if you have the means and the time, come to Prague on Easter weekend. So Michelle and I flew to Prague and watched our son go down to the baptismal font in the branch we were there 20 years previously, seeing these Czech members that had, had stayed faithful and were there and Cole baptizes our nanny from 20 years ago. We then learn a tremendous about, about, about her because we could never talk to her, right? So now Cole can sit there and translate back and forth. We learn all this amazing information about her. So my friends, that's an amazing story and one that I could certainly end on. But this is the amazing part of the story. It's never not exactly as you plan. And this month, Ika took a trip over to the Freiburg Germany temple and became endowed. It's just one of those stories that you can't forecast. You can't predict. You can't know. My amazing career at Procter & Gamble was probably far less to do with becoming a vice president and, and working in all these countries and doing all of these things and perhaps much more to do with this little story. And I can tell you, as a family, it has changed our life. And we have, we have a few of these crazy little stories where it wasn't exactly as we planned, but God has a plan. And he has a plan for each of us. And so um, with that, um, I'm going to come to one last few. I think I just have a couple minutes. I want to end, Stephen, if I can. I'm going to talk about this. What does it take in the future as you think about your career and where you're going to go? Um, by the way, I'm going to answer one question because I always get asked this. Would you, would you rather go to a Procter & Gamble and then go small entrepreneur or should I go entrepreneur and then maybe to, to a multinational or should I just go entrepreneur because I'm just an entrepreneur. I get asked it every time. Now, I'm biased because of my background. But the one thing I will tell you as I advise small companies, as I sit on their boards, there's nothing that can re replace a corporate structure, even if it's for one or two years. So I have a very strong opinion. If you get a chance, go work for it. And it doesn't need to be a Procter & Gamble. Go work for someone where it's structured and detailed and processed and systemed. And then whatever you do after that, you will be better. I promise you. It's, it was such a pain point for us and even the little companies I'm running right now when they have no context for actually how a scaled business operates and works. Um, now, I want to talk about this. If you want to be in the C-suite, if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, if you want to have high influence on strategy for an organization, there are three things you need. IQ, EQ, VQ. Everyone gets IQ. I loved it, Stephen, in your, in your opening remarks here. So here's what I call it. You need to be sufficiently smart. There are a lot of people we recruited at Procter & Gamble's with 32 um, on, the, on the ACT test and 4.0s, and they washed out all the time. And But P&G has a machine for hiring. And I began to say, we are... We are we are not just looking for smart people. We're looking for people that are also street smart. What do I mean by street smart? Say it. They get the world. Absolutely. That's exactly what I would say. You need to have self-awareness about what's going on in the world. And I don't care how book smart you are. If you don't understand people and can figure parts of that out, you're not smart enough for me. And you're never going to work for me. So... Sufficiently smart. The second thing is broad and differentiated experiences. Now, you don't have to be in five countries and six businesses and speak a few languages and et cetera, et cetera, but you do need broad experiences. And why do you need that? To my friend who just answered the question. You will never understand the world if you don't have broad and differentiated experiences. Doesn't that make sense? How many of you served a mission? Okay. Did that dramatically shape your life? That's why I love to hire Mormons who've served a mission, because they have a broad and differentiated experience. And hopefully it's just to open you up for the big opportunities you might have. I'm just going to explain for a minute. 
I believe hybrids will own and rule the world. And it used to be a hypothesis and theory I gave a lecture on five years ago. It's now just a reality. When I was running the globe for Procter & Gamble, I was spending most of my time in, in Beijing and in India and Russia, the developing countries. And every time I went into those countries, we had expatriates running the business, these you know, Americans and Western Europeans. But the smartest people in the room were these people. I did a study on them. And guess what they had? Now, you don't have to have this, but it'll, it'll help you understand my point here. Avni was one of these people. So first off, they had technical degrees, undergraduate, usually engineering, pharmacology, computer science. They came from entrepreneur families. Think of Beijing, think of China, India, and Russia. They came from entrepreneur families. So they understood commerce. They understood selling. They understood how to, to go after and, and get customers. Then they went and got their MBAs. Where did they get their MBAs? Where do you think they got their MBAs? The United States, okay? And what was important about that? They learned another culture, they learned English, and they learned everything that was important there. Now that's good enough, all right? So that's kind of interesting, technical, commercial. But here's the most important pieces. They could communicate, they could write, and they were social. Does that make sense? Now the last part here, is uh, EQ, VQ. What do I mean by that? What's EQ? Emotional quotient. What does it mean? You can relate to people. That's exactly it. It's that simple. How many people do you know that you can't relate to today? A lot. I know a lot of people I can't relate to. Maybe I'm part of the problem. Maybe they're part of the problem. But if you don't have EQ, in 2009, from 2006 to 2009, I ran P&G's salon business. We, we were in a mess. The markets were a mess. I laid off 2,500 people from 10,000 employees. If you don't have EQ and VQ, you don't have a business left at the end of that, do you? You've got to know how to talk to people and make that happen. And so, um, now the last one is VQ, and this room should totally get VQ. What is VQ? Values quotient. Do you have backbone? Do you have principles? Do you, when there's a chance to go right and a chance to go left, do you take the right choice? Do you make the right decision when no one is looking in a business sense, and by the way, I'm here in BYU, in life? Do you make the right choices? And so my friends, um, as I end this, I would like to leave you with this challenge. Two challenges. First off, there's never been a time, I'm 55 years old, there has never been a time in business that there is so much opportunity. None of it's linear. When I joined Procter & Gamble in 1986, it was completely linear. You had to spend a certain amount of time here and get promoted at a certain time here. Nothing's linear. That's why entrepreneurship is so exciting. But don't just jump into entrepreneurship because you want to be the next Josh James. Or, or Ryan at Qualtrics, or all these amazing folks that we have here, understand what you're trying to achieve and where you're trying to go. Remember, it's not exactly as you plan. There's two challenges I have for you. Hybrids are gonna own the world in terms of influence and opportunity. So wherever you are in your nature of being hybrid, if you're good commercially, you need to get more technical. If you don't understand finance, huge issue for you. And as an entrepreneur, believe me, I help so many folks with their finance problems. So if you're, if, you're, if you're technical, you need to become more commercial. If you're social, then you need to become more strategic. If you're more, if you, you know, you, you get the point, right? So wherever you are, you need to become more hybrid. And today you can do it. There, there are YouTube courses. Just jump online and start learning. But have a life plan that has the ability for you to be this broader, more hybrid person. And then the second thing, the second challenge that I have for you is as you figure this out, you need to just talk to people that have been there, done that. And I have, if you, if you want to, uh, I'll be happy to give you uh, this, uh, Stephen, but I've got a little thing that I help young people with. Five questions to one group of people, five questions to another group of people, and you will, through that, first establish a network, which is critically important. Most all of my success came through a network, did not come through my book smarts or my street smarts came through people, came through a network and people I surrounded myself with or was privileged enough to be surrounded around them. So um, first off, it's a privilege. Thanks for, not, uh, 
Thanks for listening to me. Hopefully I didn't waste your time, and I appreciate all of you for being here. Thank you.